Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture by the former Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd, and it's a great honor uh, to have him with us. Uh, thanks to him, we have a sellout crowd uh, today. So uh, I'm going to take advantage of this sellout crowd to do a brief commercial about the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. <laughs> and, you know, I've discovered that while many people have heard of us and they know that we exist, uh, most people do not know what we do. <laughs> and just to briefly tell you, our mission uh, is to improve governance uh, in Asia and beyond. That's why uh, your graduate school, a public policy, 20% of our students come from Singapore, and we try to get about 20% from China, 20% from India, 20% from Southeast Asia, and 20% from the rest of the world. And fortunately, as a result of being very successful uh, in our fundraising efforts, we are the third best endowed school of public policy in the entire world. And so while in many schools you have students chasing scholarships, uh, in our school, quite often, you have scholarships chasing students. So we hope you will pass the word around that we are actually looking for more students and more applications, uh, especially from the region. And for those of you who have connections in the region and beyond, please pass the word on that the best school of public policy to come and study in Asia is the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And that's the end of my commercial. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And now I'm going to say a brief word about the, the topic, and I can tell you that this is a topic of enormous uh, importance because the biggest story happening on the world stage is the re-emergence of China. Uh, indeed, there's no bigger story than that uh, uh, happening in the world. And there are very, very few people who actually really understand the full dimensions of it and there are very, very few people who actually know it intimately and who speak the language and who have met the leaders and we are very fortunate that today we have that man here before us and that man of course is Prime Minister uh, Kevin Rudd. Uh, he's had the great uh, pleasure of working very closely uh, with the Chinese leaders and indeed right now he's spending a year uh, in Harvard University uh, where he's leading a major research effort on building a new strategic relationship between China and the United States. Now, uh, I, will, I would very much like to go down right away, but I, I know that Kevin Rudd needs no introduction. But let me give you a brief description uh, of his career. Uh, he graduated from ANU with a BA in Asian Studies and majored in Chinese Language and History. He was a former diplomat, in fact, serving in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs with postings in places like Stockholm and Beijing. He first joined the Australian Parliament as a Labour MP in 1998. In 2001, he was appointed Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, and in 2000 weeks, 2006, he won an overwhelming uh, victory in the Labour Party, and led, this led to an overwhelming Labour Party victory in the in national elections in 2007, and he began two terms uh, as Prime Minister. And during his terms, there were some uh, very important breakthroughs, including Australia's signing of the Kyoto Protocol, the parliamentary apology to the stolen generations, and the 2020 uh, summit. He resigned his prime ministership in 2010 to Julia Gillard and became a foreign minister, and June 2013 went back and became a uh, labor leader and prime minister for a second time. And after September 2013, he resigned from parliament, and he's now, uh, I guess, a, a, a bit like me, Kevin, partly practitioner, partly academic. <laughs> so with that, Kevin, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this stage. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kishore, for those uh, very warm words of welcome. And to all of you good folks uh, who have come out here to Lee Kuan Yew this school this afternoon. I also acknowledge my former Chief of Staff, Foreign Policy Advisor when I was Prime Minister, and now the Australian High Commissioner here in Singapore, Philip Green. Philip, good to see you here as well. 
uh, and other colleagues who I've met in many incarnations around the world at various times. And so thank you for honouring me with your presence here this afternoon as well. Um, I was listening to Kishore's uh, rendition of my career before, and um, it reminds me of a discussion that I had, which Philip attended, I think, uh, in Beijing during one of those uh, evolutions of my career. And uh, after I had uh, uh, left the Prime Ministership uh, and uh, gone to Beijing, I was uh, working my way to a Chinese gallery uh, called uh, the Red Lantern Gallery, where I had to open an Australian art exhibition. And uh, given I had uh, just um, uh, resigned from the Prime Ministership, there was a large gathering of uh, Chinese media. And uh, the question from my friends in the Chinese media was really basic. It was said, Kevin, you're alive. <laughs> and look how any high wardrobe. We've got our Chinese friends here. Who's here from China? Good to see you, folks. The, um, and so, oh, so many Chinese people. So many Chinese people. So many Chinese people. So many Chinese people. So many Chinese I just said, don't worry about it, I'll try and speak in Australian dialect so you can't understand a word that I'm saying. <laughs> but I then went through my career, which said, well, look, I began as a uh, son of a farmer. I went and learned Chinese at university. I then became a foreign service officer and a career diplomat uh, like uh, Kishaw. Uh, I then um, uh, entered the Australian Parliament. I then became a shadow minister for foreign affairs. I then became um, leader of the opposition. I was then elected as prime minister. And now I'm foreign minister. And very soon I'll be back to uh, the Australian embassy in Beijing as the first secretary. And uh, I said, this is a standard career trajectory. <laughs> Now, I'm glad, Kishore, you've corrected this trajectory by having me at this illustrious school. I'm feeling much better already. Um, it's uh, interesting now being at Harvard University at the Kennedy School, uh, where, as in this school, the, the Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, the whole subject of public policy is taken seriously, analytically, and comprehensively, and not least in the international policy domain. And as Kishore said in his introduction before, there is no greater question confronting us as a community of nations at present as to how collectively we manage the rise of China. Will it be peaceful? Will it not be peaceful? Will it be a win-win outcome, as various Chinese leaders have said, or will it be a zero-sum game? Will it be a rise of China which is to the collective economic benefit of the planet? Will it be a rise of China which benefits some but not all? Will it be a rise which uh, enables us to deal comprehensively with the global challenge of climate change? Or will it compound the challenge of climate change globally? Uh, this is a profound question facing all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean China itself as well. I uh, recently, just now, this morning, flown in from Beijing, where I've spent the last few days talking with colleagues from the foreign ministry and the various think tanks in Beijing who deal with these questions as well, as I've done most recently in the United States, not just at Harvard, and as I'll do with colleagues here tomorrow at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Let me put it in one stark proposition to all of you, uh, which I think the world needs to think about. If in the course of the next decade, uh, China becomes the largest economy in the world. Under those circumstances, this would be the first time since George III uh, was the King of England that you will have a non-English speaking, uh, non-Western, non-democratic state as the largest economy in the world. That's quite a long time since that's been the case. And therefore, of itself, anyone who assumes that if that change occurs, it will not have an impact on the current rules of the global and regional order, I believe is deluding themselves. The question we face, therefore, is what changes that might be. And therefore, how do we work with our Chinese friends to 
conclude those changes in a manner which is compatible with the interests of all. There's a Chinese academic uh, who may be known to some of you called Professor Yuan Shui Tong, uh, who was at uh, Tsinghua University, where I'm also a visiting scholar. The Yen Shui Tong is often uh, regarded as belonging to uh, the, uh, the Nationalist School of Chinese Foreign Policy. He's a good friend of mine. In fact, I recently wrote a cover endorsement for one of his books to promote his publication. He told me yesterday that sales are doing very well. But in his book, which only came out a few months ago, here are two or three sets of numerics which I think are worth reflecting on. Number one. By 2023, the GDP of the United States will reach 19 trillion, while the GDP of China will be 17 trillion. That's according to the current exchange rate. However, in the next decade, the value of the renminbi uh, would appreciate 20% against the US dollar, rising to a rate of 1 is to 5, which means that by 2023, based on the predicted exchange rate, the overall size of GDP of China will reach nearly 21 trillion, that is, against American GDP of 19 trillion, and therefore surpass that of the United States, becoming the number one economy and taking the share of the whole world's economy <clears throat> to 30%. It's worth reflecting on that metric itself. Number one, the relative rise of the uh, Chinese GDP. And number two, in market exchange rate terms, given a forward projection of where market exchange rates uh, or exchange rates have gone with yuan so far, a 25% appreciation over the last uh, five to seven years, and where that's likely to go into the future, given the recent announcement too about the increasing band against which the yuan can move in the future, Yen Shui Tong's prediction is that by 2023, which is nine years from now, uh, China will have the largest economy in the world. Number two, his second assertion is as follows. By 2023, the influence of the renminbi against other countries would reach 50% or higher of that of the US dollar in terms of international train, uh, trade and foreign currency reserves uh, around the world. In other words, what his assertion there is that 50% of transactions, trade-related transactions and foreign currency reserves in the currency in which they're denominated would be made up of the Chinese Yuan. His third uh, proposition is as follows. By 2023, China's military expenditure would reach 60 to 80 percent of that of the United States, while the current ratio between China and the US is about one is to six. He goes on to project that China by that stage may have a manned space station, three to five carrier battle groups, four to five submarines with strategic nuclear missiles with a range of 8,000 kilometers, and the fifth generation of military deployments equipped with J-20 and J-31 stealth fighters in service. That is one academic's projection. I'm not about to enter into the debate about the accuracy or inaccuracy of each of them, either the projected size of Chinese uh, GDP or the projected presence of the yuan uh, in terms of yuan-denominated global financial transactions uh, by 2023, or whether the specific projections on Chinese military expenditure are necessarily accurate either but they point in a general direction. And what we have seen from uh, parallel publications around the world is almost always, but not university, a parallel trend. So what does this mean? I think in our analysis of the rise of China, it's important for us to bear in mind two sets or three sets of propositions. Number one, where does China believe that it is going? What does Xi Jinping mean by China's dream? Number two, um, what do we project China's capabilities as being in a decade's time across the aggregation of Chinese national power? Where will their political system be in 2023? Uh, where will their net economic performance be in 2023, 10 years of the implementation of the new Chinese economic growth model? Where will Chinese environmental constraints take the Chinese economy and Chinese society by 2023? 
Where will China's energy security lie by 2023? And then there is a third set of considerations beyond the dream, beyond capabilities, and into the subjective realm of China's specific strategic intentions. What does China say in its declaratory policy about what it wants to do in the region and the world? And on top of that, what does China demonstrate by its operational behaviour it is doing in the region and the world? If we're going to be rational in our analysis of these things, each must be taken in its sequence. I intend to say just one or two things about each of those categories and then make some concluding remarks before opening it to a much longer discursive session among all of us here this afternoon. China's dream. Zhongguo Meng. China's dream. It's very difficult to walk around the streets of Beijing these days and not be confronted with a billboard, a Guanggao, which says, here is China's dream, Zhongguo Meng. Uh, yesterday, when I was driving around Beijing from one thing to another, I would have, I counted something like 25 different billboards telling me what China's dream was. But let's go to what the man himself says, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, uh, in his speech, defining speech about China's dream, issued not long after he was elected General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party at the end of 2012, <clears throat> said the following. He described China's dream as one, national rejuvenation. Number two, the improvement of people's livelihood. Three, prosperity. Four, the construction of a better society. And five, military strengthening. In other words, if you look at that carefully, the China dream as defined by Xi Jinping is both individual, people's livelihoods, prosperity, a better society. It is also, however, about the power of the state, that is, military strengthening. It is also about the standing of the nation in its own eyes and the eyes of the world, national rejuvenation. He goes on to state that young people should, and I quote him, dare to dream work assiduously to fulfil their dreams and contribute to the revitalisation of the nation. To fulfil their dreams and to contribute to the revitalisation of the nations. In fact, when you look at the billboards around Beijing, one of the billboards containing a couple of cute Confucian kids uh, dressed in traditional Confucian gear, uh, has one with a large thought bubble coming out of his head saying, Zhongguo Meng, War the Meng, China's dream, my dream. Um, in other words, uh, what Xi Jinping is saying is, go out there, work hard to realise your personal dream for your lives and your prosperity and your families, and at the same time, through that effort and beyond those efforts, build a strong China as well. <clears throat> And the parallelism of uh, the current campaign about Zhongguo Meng is very much along those lines. Work hard for yourself. Realise a, uh, a great return for yourself and your family and there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. At the same time, build a strong China. All part of a unified dream. At a more different level, um, the party's theoretical journal uh, which is Chou uh, Shi, uh, Seeking. Uh, it's the theoretical journal of the Chinese Communist Party, not known for its sense of humour. Um, and anyone who has found a joke ever in Chou Shi, uh, I'd like to see them after this meeting, because having read it now for the better part of 25 years, I've never found one. But theoretical journals for communist parties are really designed for that purpose. So what does the party's theoretical journal say about China's dream? It says this, the Chinese dream is about Chinese prosperity, collective effort, socialism and national glory. Let me repeat that again. It's about Chinese prosperity, collective effort, socialism and national glory. And it goes on to say, it is this sort of dream as to differentiate it from the American dream, the words of Chou Shi, not uh, the uh, interpolation by me. 
put those things together, what I'm saying to you is that there is a large project in state building and nation building which goes to the very core of uh, Xi Jinping's dream for the future. And at the same time, um, in the public articulation of his dream, widens the canvas further to embrace young people to pursue their dreams for their lives as well and brings both together. Xi Jinping also is a person who believes in timelines. Xi Jinping, in my judgment, is a man in a hurry. Xi Jinping knows that according to the Chinese political system, he's likely to have 10 years in office, and he's just gone through the one year point, like Pope Francis. He's just passed his first anniversary. So he's got nine years to go. And he is very much focused already, as Chinese leaders tend to be, on what contribution he'll be seen by history as having delivered to his country. They talk in China often, and particularly under Xi Jinping, about the importance of the two 100-year uh, anniversaries, which are looming in China's future. The first, of course, is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party by, in 2021. The 2021 anniversary will, of, of course, fall uh, before Xi Jinping's expiration of term in 2023. That anniversary, therefore, has a particular resonance. The projection I would make is that when you look at what Xi Jinping says about this first 100-year anniversary, he says the material goal to be achieved by 2021 is for China to become a moderately well-off society. The second is a 100th anniversary, not just of the Communist Party, but in fact of the founding of the People's Republic in 2049. Uh, Kishore and I will still be here lecturing at that time. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, and when it comes to his definition of where China should be by 2049, Xi Jinping says that China should by that stage have become a relatively developed economy, country, and society. Let me give you my interpolation as to what I think these two dreams uh, mean in terms of how the party will seek to celebrate them. Uh, when we get to 2021, I believe the aspiration within the Chinese Communist Party and leadership is to be able to use that anniversary, the 100th anniversary of communism in China, to celebrate uh, the Chinese economy surpassing that of the United States. And based on one set of projections, Yen Shui Tung's, but a whole range of projections in addition to his, that is within reach. And the message to the Chinese people is, whatever you think about the Chinese Communist Party, let me tell you, we've managed to bring you to a status where 150 years ago, we were ridiculed by the world and the object of European colonial domination. And now, 100 years into the Communist Party's existence, and barely 70 years into its rule of the country, we've turned this economy into the largest one in the world. It will be a validation of the Communist Party's leadership, if it's delivered. The second, for which I have no particular evidence, is this. If you look at the forward projections of Chinese military expenditure, produced most recently by CIPRI in Stockholm, the Stockholm Institute for uh, Peace and International Research, uh, together with other calculations of the military balance by the International Institute of Strategic Studies, it has <coughs> China's uh, aggregate uh, defense spending passing that of the United States around about 2035. Now, of course, uh, the United States has a massive accumulated stock of military capabilities, hardware, and software. Uh, but it is entirely conceivable that the second anniversary of the People's Republic uh, to be celebrated, namely that of the founding of the nation itself in 2049, will be used as an opportunity to proclaim not just economic parity to be achieved by 21, but in fact, military parity as well. Therefore, the whole notion of a China dream and what it means personally and nationally, and the timetables within the national part of that are to be reflected in terms of China's economic growth and its military growth are worthy of reflection. A word about capabilities and a word about intentions. 
On capabilities, uh, we often look at pure numbers and assume that is the totality of the story. Um, however, the core task which this leadership of the Communist Party face now across all the capability requirements which add up in aggregate terms as net national power, the most fundamental of them is economic development, the economic growth model and the looming environmental constraint on that growth model. We could talk about all the other constraints as well. I'm sure some of them will come up in the Q&A. But on the economic growth model itself, the number one story in Beijing, both through the National People's Congress, third plenum of the most uh, recently convened Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, have all focused on what is called the decision, the jue ding. And the jue ding uh, is about the transformation of the Chinese growth model. Um, without drilling in, down to it in any depth, in summary form, it's this. The model which served China well for 35 years based on low wages, labor intensive, manufacturers for export, um, leaving environmental externalities as external and not pricing them, has produced rapid economic growth, but has also produced not just rising living standards, but rising wage levels as well, and uh, a problem in terms of the economic side of the account. This is the model which has served China well so far. However, the conclusion at the centre is that this model must now change to what is called the new, new growth model. And they go, Jing Ji Xin, the more sure. And it refers to the need to have as the future driver of China's economic growth, high levels of Chinese domestic consumption as opposed to unsustainable levels of state investment. Secondly, for that consumption to be fed by China's rising urban middle classes, and thirdly, consistent with the economic development pattern across economic history, to be driven in large part by the services sector, uh, and the services sector being more environmentally friendly than secondary industry and other elements of the production process. This new economic growth model has just been agreed. There are other dimensions to it as well, including a greater role for private firms as opposed to state-owned enterprises in what is recognised as needing to be a necessary level playing field in the Chinese economy so that efficiency levels are improved over where they are at present. And as a further evidence of that, a further dimension of this again is what is called financial sector reform, that is how is all of the above to be financed and through more realistic uh, interest rate returns for consumers who are currently at, uh, providing the state with high levels of savings and funding a lot of the expenditure which is occurring by the state uh, and state-owned corporations within the economy and more broadly allowing f the financial sector to have greater autonomy than it currently has. The success or failure of this economic transformation project will determine whether Xi Jinping's dream succeeds or fails. Therefore, for those of us in the business of political economy, this should be the central object of our study for the period ahead. One final point in terms of constraints. You would have seen uh, the uh, recent uh, reporting from Beijing, including pictures of Xi Jinping standing outside on a day when the particulate concentration in the atmosphere in Beijing or in the air around Beijing was something like 800 parts per million. He did that for a particular purpose, not just to demonstrate solidarity with the masses, uh, but to demonstrate the fact that he and the leadership now get it, that this is a number one political priority for the government's future credibility uh, with the country at large. And where it dovetails with the transformation of the economic model is to underline the absolute imperative nature of that transformation of the model occurring sooner rather than later, to take, put less pressure on the carbon intensity of the economy, uh, but also to deal with the day-to-day -day challenges people are increasingly finding in having confidence that they can breathe the air in the cities in which they live. And despite popular myth, this is not just Beijing, it's Shanghai, it's Guangzhou, it's Chongqing, it's Chengdu, uh, it's Taiyuan, it's uh, Xi'an, it is Nanjing, it is right across the country. This is now 
one of the two top political challenges facing the Chinese leadership. And my final point is this, when it comes to capabilities. In order to achieve this economic transformation that I've referred to above, which in turn will determine whether this Chinese dream that we speak of will succeed or fail, and in order to do that in a manner which is environmentally sustainable, Xi Jinping has concluded he needs to have a very large concentration of political power in his own hands. But the concentration and consolidation of political power in Xi Jinping's hands in the last 12 months has been unprecedented in recent Chinese political history. We have not seen anything like this. It is not just the three traditional positions associated with the Chinese leader, namely being president of the country, Guo Jia Zhuxi, general secretary of the party, Zhongguo Gongchang Dan Zhong Shuji, or the Junshu Wei and Hui Zhu Ren, chairman of the Central Military Commission. It is a whole bunch, now seven in number, of leading groups, so-called Lindao Xiaozu, which cover every aspect of central policy from national security through the economy through to the reform of the military, which he now also personally heads. At the same time, a large and growing scope of an anti-corruption campaign, which is now seeing many, many individuals put into detention and legal cases being unfolded against them. Many people have asked the question, why is this so? To which the answer is this. My conclusion is that Xi Jinping has um, concluded himself that the process of the transformation of the economic growth model, particularly given the constraints which are faced both in terms of the future health of the global economy and the domestic environmental constraint, he anticipates that this is going to be a rocky political road. And therefore, he's concluded that this is a time in which he needs to have maximum concentration of political authority in his own hands. And that is why he is doing what he is doing. To conclude, and we can take this in Q&A, on long-term intentions, and that is the second part of my remarks here today, about what is the foreign policy dimension of these domestic drivers that I've just referred to. This is the open question. And the open question which our Chinese friends must increasingly answer to the international community is this. If for 100 years China has dreamt of national wealth and power, uh, once that national wealth and power is obtained against some of the timelines I've just referred to, how will China then use that wealth and power in the regional and global order? If you speak to Chinese theoreticians, if you speak to Chinese policy advisors and policy planners, if you speak to those working in the think tanks in Beijing, including senior ministers in the Chinese government, and ask this question, the response is usually along these lines. We are working on that. My response to my Chinese friends is, I think the international community are going to want to know earlier as to what China's intentions on that question are. The Chinese State Council for Foreign Affairs, uh, Yang Jiechi, and uh, the current Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, made it very clear in recent statements in the last several months that the purpose of uh, Chinese diplomacy is not only one to assist in the realization of the Chinese dream and to create in Yang Jiechi's uh, language uh, in terms of China's neighboring states and its own immediate region, a better environment for the future for China. But on the global order itself, these uh, two leaders of the Chinese foreign policy establishment also say that they want to see changes to the international system in order to make it more fair and just. And so the question is this, what does a better strategic environment for China in its neighbouring countries in its immediate region look like from Beijing's perspective? And secondly, what are these fairer and more just rules for the international order which the Chinese leaders now speak about? These form part, a core part, of the research project which I now lead at Harvard. And that is why I've, it's been my great pleasure to be able to spend here some time at the Lee Kuan Yew School to be able to sit down with scholars as well to work through these deep questions which affect not just China's future, but all of our futures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was fascinating. Uh, as a moderator, I have the great privilege of asking the first question. Good. 
And well, I'm going to ask a question that uh, I suspect is on everybody's mind. Because, you know, you mentioned that there's been an unprecedented uh, accumulation of power by Xi Jinping. It's pretty obvious. So he's been able to do in one year what many leaders fail to do after several years. And you've met the man several times. I've only met him once. I think we were in Beijing together hmm. on that occasion. Uh, how would you characterize the man? And what, what would you say are his strengths and what makes him unique or different from the other leaders? That's uh, an excellent question, Kishore. And um, uh, when uh, Kishore was in Beijing for a meeting of a body of which we are both members. Um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping made it clear to those of us around at the time that um, uh, Kishore's publications are widely read in Beijing and by the leadership. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, worthwhile bearing that in mind. Xi Jinping, in my experience of him, and from what I've read as well, uh, but you pick this up, hmm just from sitting with him and talking with him at length, is that he's a person very comfortable in his own skin. He's not trying to be something he's not. Uh, he's a born leader. Number two, as a consequence of that, he's very comfortable with the exercise of power. Um, and that, I presume, is a uh, product of both personality but also upbringing. He's been brought up with uh, China's uh, leadership elites. He's known them all well personally. He's been through their ups and downs over a long period of time. His father, Xi Zhongxin, uh, was both a military commander uh, during uh, the Revolutionary War, as well as uh, a person who assisted Deng Xiaoping uh, in the first phase of the uh, pragmatic management of the Chinese economy in the 1950s before they both fell foul of the Cultural Revolution and both were purged as a result and then both came back together and Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongxin, was given the job of running the implementation of China's open door policy as it affected the four special economic zones. Uh, Xiamen, Zhuhai, Shenzhen, Shantou. Mm. And so <clears throat> Xi Jinping has seen the exercise of power for him and against him up close and personal. Mm. Uh, he therefore understands acutely the nature of the political dynamics of working within what is still a one-party state. The third thing is this, I have discovered him, and I disagree with many analysts who've put a different view, to be a person who is deeply uh, wedded to a deep reading of history. Mm. Others have said his familiarity with Chinese classical history is thin. I, I have not found that. Is a person who's acutely conscious of um, how China has become what it has become given its historical circumstances, very literate when it comes to 19th century Qing history, the fall of uh, the Qing Empire and uh, the, the failures of the Republican government, and has more than a passing familiarity with world history. Put all that together then, what do we find? A person who, uh, in my judgment, is a professional and consummate politician because that's been the environment in which he has grown up. He's absorbed it viscerally. He hasn't had to learn it from a book. And secondly, he has a deep uh, familiarity with history, both of the country and the party. And in terms of a personal mission statement, many would find this surprising. As I mentioned to you before we came here tonight, sure, he, like many other Chinese leaders, is a nationalist. He wants the best for his country. He wants his country to return to a position of global preeminence. But underneath that, he wants to be the savior of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Xi Jinping is a party idealist, in my view, and that explains a large part of the current anti-corruption campaign, which he believes is necessary to save the party from imploding on itself. Now, since this room couldn't accommodate everyone, we have a spillover room next door. People are listening over there. And one of our students uh, has posed this question to Jan Sheng, an MPA student. And two questions. One is, how do you see the U.S. rebalancing strategy or the U.S. pivot strategy, as it is more popularly known? And how do you think the China-U.S. and China-U.S.-Japan relationship will play in this triangular relationship? 
Well, they are two of the most um, difficult questions of all. That's why I posed that. <laughs> the, uh, well, the first one is this. Um, on the rebalance, I've said this in an article I wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine last night, uh, last, night last year, not last night. Um, uh, For you, one night is like a year. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you too, mate. <laughs> the, um, it's uh, uh, the rebalance as a reflection of US long-term intentions towards this region was necessary. Mm. Uh, and the reason for it is that uh, within the region, mm. many people had concluded as a result of Iraq and Afghanistan and a decade plus of Middle Eastern preoccupations mm. that the United States was incrementally uh, walking away from this part of the world. Um, but it's not just the rebalance itself, it's a revitalization of US bilateral relationships in the region and on top of that, um, America joining for the first time a regional multilateral institution with a security focus, namely the EAS, uh, a nascent institution, but which can become something greater. And thirdly, on top of that, um, the uh, free trade drive through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In other words, what does all that symbolise? The American administration under President Obama in his first term and Hillary Clinton as its Secretary of State saying, America is in the region to stay. Now, I think that has provided the basis for there to be now a serious engagement between the Chinese and the United States in a process of regular summitry on dealing with the totality of their relationship, good and bad, areas where there's trust and areas where there's no trust at all. And the fact that uh, 35 years into normalization, and it is the 35th anniversary of US-China uh, normalization this year, um, is that it is only in the last 12 months that we've begun a process of regular annual summitry with a regular working agenda on the totality of the relationship from cybersecurity down to trademarks is a good step. The fact that uh, we have uh, not had such a mechanism before has meant that uh, Chinese uh, presidents and uh, American presidents often met either at the edge of other meetings like uh, whether it's uh, APEC or whether it's uh, the EAS or others, or a G20 meeting, or uh, they're in contact only when there was a crisis. The challenge is this, for both sides to use this process of regular summit diplomacy, and the next one will be in China in the second half of this year, I hope earlier in the second half rather than later, uh, will be to uh, consolidate that agenda of where the two countries can work together in a list which should include cybersecurity, a list which should include North Korea, a list which should include where to in the future with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China long-term in or out and under what conditions. Fourthly, on top of that, rules of the regional road, by which I mean how do we avoid maritime incidents at sea, whether it's in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, uh, in terms of China and Japan, and other items as well, that is some building long-term regional architecture. Now, this process has barely begun. It is not even nine months old. Um, I'm a strong supporter of it. I've written it publicly. I've um, done my own bit privately with both governments to encourage in this direction over a long period of time. Japan. I wish I had a crystal ball. <coughs> uh, as you know, uh, the um, toxicity in the relationship between Tokyo and Beijing at present is the worst it's been since normalization in 1972. Yeah. Uh, and that's a long time ago. Uh, even I was um, barely at high school. That's a long time ago. And so it's a big call when you say it's the worst it's been in more than 40 years. Um, <clears throat> the core challenge is this. By whatever mechanism, direct or indirect diplomacy, for both Tokyo and Beijing, to identify a means by which this issue on uh, Daoyudao Senkoku can be strategically parked once again to the side and left there for another 40 years. There is no solution to Daoyudao Senkoku. The positions on sovereignty are equally clear on both sides of the agenda. And you can argue either case from either perspective for another 100 years and the other side would still not agree. So the challenge of diplomacy is to take this particular, excise this particular cancer from the relationship before it spreads any further. 
There are ways to do that. I've just recently co-authored a piece with Joe Nye from mm. Harvard, um, which hopefully will be published in the not too far distant future, outlining some practical ideas on that. And my final point about Japan is this. I believe in Beijing, I can't speak for Tokyo because I haven't been there recently. Um, there is no appetite for any type of low-level conflict with Japan uh, over this island by accident or by design. Looked at purely from a Chinese perspective, this goes in the wrong direction in terms of their interests. I think the wiser heads in Tokyo also have that view. Therefore, the practical diplomatic challenge is what I describe as identifying the parking place in the car park to put this bloody thing. Um, <laughs> and that's what a number of folks, many more intelligent than I, are working on at present. Great, Great answers. Okay, first question. In the yes, big room. Please, yeah. In this room, yes. Please come up to the microphone. Yes, Good. yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, Mr. Uh, Rudd. If you don't mind, identify yourself and please ask a short, sharp question. Yeah. I'll try and be short and sharp, Mr. Rudd. My name is Jeffrey Ford. I'm a lowly hedge fund manager here in Singapore. And uh, my question relates with absolutely nothing to do with China in uh, 2023, but more to do with Australia and China in 1923. And I wanted to ask this question not so much on behalf of myself, but on behalf as a fourth generation Australian, on behalf of my parents, their parents, and the parents before them, but more so for my daughter when I talk about Australia being the land of the fair go and mateship. Australia's undergone quite a lot of melancholy reflection in the, uh, on its socio, economic, and political policies in the past. And we've seen apologies, and rightly so, apologies evolving out of that. The one thing that we haven't seen, um, and I hope this doesn't infringe on um, any uh, protocol bar on domestic politics, but you are wearing a blue tie and you're a Labour man, so I think I have that covered. <laughs> and um, uh, we've, we've not seen any momentum or, or push for what was an abhorrent policy which affected as many people as the um, apology to the stolen children, that was the White Australia policy. It, it's something which has been part of our past, but never never discussed. There's been regret expressed, but never an apology. And that obviously has um, coloured and shaped our relationship with China, and to a degree some of the other countries in, in Southeast Asia and Asia as well. And I just wonder what, as a politician, or as a former politician, what, what has been your perception of how we have viewed that particular part of our history? Well, my perception is shaped by my own family, because none of my kids have chosen to marry Caucasian so far. So... <laughs> All I'm saying is, Australia is changing. You know, my son-in-law is Chinese, my daughter-in-law is Malaysian, Australian. The face of Australia is changing. Now, if you want me to go through the history of the white Australia policy, um, it is appalling at every level, for which I make no excuses. It was just there. Um, but the policy has now been extinct uh, for the better part of 45 years, going on 50. Now, um, on, uh, if we look at the current composition of immigration to Australia, correct me if I'm wrong, Philip, but I think it's as much Asian as it is non-Asian, isn't it? But on the numbers. Um, go to the streets of Sydney. Are you from Sydney, sir? No, I'm actually from your home state. Oh, from the People's Republic of Queensland. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> the, um, but does the argument fall it, down? It, because <laughs> we, we also have immigration in America uh, to the same degree, but we've also seen an apology to the Japanese Americans for what happened during the war. And the indigenous, the taking of the stolen children happened many, many years ago, and we've stopped that. But we've still found time. I suppose to what we've done, them. look, I'm not trying to walk away from this because, frankly, as Prime Minister, no one ever put it to me that it was necessary. I choose to lead by example. My example is my family. My family is from everywhere. I don't think you can get more personal than that. Um, and I'm proud of each and every one of them and love them dearly. Uh, and that's the new face of Australia. Yeah. So, look, I'm not a against the idea, mate. It's just never been put to me. Um, and uh, I think it was monstrously offensive for previous Australian governments to have uh, latched themselves to this policy. <coughs> and uh, they had the good sense, finally, uh, on a bipartisan basis to get rid of it. And that's nearly half a century ago. And may anything like that never return again. I am worried in other parts of the world where I see the, the re-emergence of um, elements of racism. Uh, and thankfully, thankfully in our country, uh, these things um, on all sides of politics reasonably well managed. 
Thank you. Next question, uh, lady over here. Can yeah. you identify yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Dreema from St. Andrews Junior College. Hi. Um, the question I wanted to ask is, over the last weekend, 100,000 people across Australia took to the streets for March in March. And kind of a passive aggressive kind of protest with signs saying, go home, Tony, you're drunk. And yeah, so I, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to see what your views are on this March in March. All right. Um, well, well, what is, what, 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 what is this March in March, by the way? I'm not sure what it is. What happened? <laughs> I, th I think it's been a protest against the uh, current Abbott government. Um, well, by over 100,000 people. Yeah, well, that's a reasonable number of people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when I said, when I stood up in the Parliament at the end of uh, last year that uh, I was moving on to a different phase in my um, public life, I actually meant it. Uh, and by which I mean, uh, I really do see myself uh, as a global citizen. Uh, the world, and Kishore sure knows this from his own life experience and the work he does here in Singapore, has a stack of transnational, international and global problems. That's where I'm focused at the moment. How do we prevent some mindless bun fight uh, in uh, the East China Sea from wrecking the region. That's a pretty practical problem, I think. How do we manage the long-term rise of China so that we negotiate it peacefully rather than falling into what the theoreticians describe as the Thucydides trap of a existing great power uh, preventing a great, an, an emerging great power from rising or an emerging great power from rising to take preemptive actions against an existing power? These are profound questions, as is, can we get a Chinese-American agreement on climate change? I'd much rather work on that uh, for the future. Domestic politics, there are a whole bunch of folks in charge of that at the moment. I wish them well. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to interfere in the internal affairs of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> name is Rohit. I'm a resident of Singapore, a fan of the Lee Kuan Yew School and a fan of yours. Back to China. So fan of his or a fan of mine? Both. Okay. <laughs> so my, my, question, <laughs> my question is back to China, being on Australia. What is your view on the uh, Chinese policy of the string of pearls in South Asia, these ports in uh, Burma, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Gwadar port in Pakistan, and this land connection that the Nawaz Sharif's government is, uh, having, is planning between China and Pakistan for exports, and a very smart encircling of India through commerce and through upgrading the ports of uh, friendly nations. What's your view on that? Um, look, if you are China and you're about to become the largest economy in the world, what's the view from Beijing? And uh, I say this to describe, not to defend or anything else, but the view from Beijing is um, we don't want to have uh, our maritime exit points into the Pacific as our only points for the export of our product. We are therefore building huge um, uh, energy corridors across Central Asia. They're being done through various of the Central Asian stands um, and other projects of the type you've just referred to in let's call it South Asia as well. Um, secondly, uh, what drives that is not just uh, access to markets, what drives that is long-term energy security. If you were sitting around the table of the Standing Committee of the Politburo right now, political stability is number one priority in the preservation of the rule of the Communist Party. Number two, making sure people have got a job uh, through enough economic growth without strangling ourselves environmentally. Number three, making sure there's enough energy. And everything else comes 5th, 6th, 12th, 20th, 29th and 31st after that. They regard that as the basic stuff. Now, on String of Pearls, which goes beyond, shall I say, uh, as it's described in the literature, uh, beyond the economic imperative and the energy imperative of diversifying your points of uh, ingress and egress from the Chinese landmass. Um, for those who project that this is uh, simply China widening its uh, strategic sphere of influence, um, can I make this point? Um, Look very carefully at, um, if you're putting this into some future global strategic contest, how on earth um, can you operate uh, with um, uh, naval bases for offensive naval operations out of those centres without making yourself immediately vulnerable to surrounding air power? 
There is a huge operational question here for those of you who are study defence and strategic studies, which is you can only operate offensive capabilities at length from your home ports um, if you have massive, not just carrier-based capability, but in support of that, massive uh, refuelling capabilities at sea as well. And there is, I say, decades and decades and decades uh, of investment necessary before uh, PLAN, the People's Liberation Army's Navy, um, would achieve the capabilities which the Americans only really achieved in the period uh, between the wars. Uh, the second. So, I've read the literature on the String of Pearls. I understand <coughs> Indian reactions to it. I've spoken to the Indian government about it on a number of occasions in various capacities. But I think we need to be very sober in our analysis as to uh, what uh, force multiplier this would ever apply to the Chinese Navy uh, if it chose to operate intentionally uh, in an offensive manner in the future. And I would say it's limited. Okay, I, I see as usual the questions are piling up. So uh, maybe we'll take three at a time. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll take these three and I'll come to you three. And you, if you want to take notes, feel free to do so, uh, Kevin. Okay. But we'll take three of you, if you don't mind, quickly, uh, because we are running out of time. So uh, let's take three questions from here. Yeah, uh, good evening. And Mr. I have also have one question in the other room, which I'm going to pose in a while after this. Yes. Okay, good evening, Mr. Vat. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm from St. George Junior College in Singapore. So um, lately, China has taken a rather a position that, in my opinion, is rather silent on affairs where it concerns America, Russia in particular. Uh, over the weekend, China just abstained from the UNSC resolution. And so I would like to ask this question. What do you think will be China's new role, new role in, the, in the new global order as Chinese leaders have said, like what you say in your speech, just, fair and just glo uh, new global order. Now, what will this entail for the global uh, economy and uh, glo global political outlook? Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Ramita Kandapudi, and I'm a student at the Singapore American School. Um, in class, we've been talking about how there's a recent slight increase in the local level of political activity um, among Chinese citizens. So how do you think this very basic level of decentralization of power um, will impact China's future, if at all? Thank you. Thank you. A question of decentralization, yeah. OK. La last question. Uh, I'm Lalit from Melbourne, but I'm not asking question on Australia. I've been in, Mel I'm in Asia for the last 15 years applying information technology in Asia, most part of Southeast Asia. My, my question actually comes from the point you raised earlier, and particularly comparing America and China, and particularly the system, 70 years validation. But the fundamental question I have and I'm trying to grapple with is that while America was built on some very basic fundamentals of individual enterprise and uh, very deep education and freedom, then enabled by right government policies, which kind of continued to scale and not only helped America, but it kind of reached out to become a global leader. While for China with the system, uh, and so far it has served, but do you think that this can scale up? Do you think it can continue not just for China, but for its interest uh, for a better world? OK, let me give um, okay. a quick answer to those three. Uh, China's uh, impact on the future global order. I wish I could give you an easy answer to that and a quick answer, an effective one. And my honest answer is, I don't know. I'm spending the entire year on that. And I'm, think, I'm thinking it through very carefully. I don't want to use language loosely. But if you want an insight, it's the one you just pointed to before, which is as follows. Uh, the Security Council resolution, uh, which you pointed to last Saturday uh, in New York, or Sunday, in New York on um, Crimea. It's very simple. You have two sets of competing interests in China's mind. Number one. China has said to the Russians, first visit that Xi Jinping took abroad in March or February last year, Russia is our closest friend in the world. You see the reasons for that. Both believe in multi multipolarity in the global system. Uh, both believe in um, the fact that US alliance structures, one in Asia, the other in Europe, constrain their freedom from operation. <laughs> and thirdly, it's a very close relationship now economically with uh, China having become Russia's largest trading partner. Um, 
But on the other side of the ledger, you have an even deeper Chinese national interest, uh, which is Hubu Gansha, mutual non-interference, and Zhenjing, Dui Fang De Zhu Quan, which is respecting the sovereignty uh, of uh, the other party, including their national territory and territorial integrity. And when those two principles have been put, those two interests have been put one up against the other, it's quite clear how they were resolved. And that is the second issue was a dominant concern over the first in China's thinking, hence why they abstained and did not support the Russian veto against the uh, Crimean slash Ukrainian resolution. Where this heads in the future, the key question is how China believes it shall contribute to the construction of what the literature describes as global public goods. Five years ago, they didn't believe they had a role in contributing to global public goods. Now, the definitive speeches say they do. So when you talk about global public goods, it's everything from peacekeeping in the UN system at one end through to what we do for the global commons on the environment to the other, to global financial market stability on the other. These scripts are being worked through as we speak. The feeling in Beijing is that's where they want to go. But putting flesh on the bones of that is a complex business. And that's why I'm cautious in what I say. Can I just quickly, if you don't mind, there's a related question from the other room. Mm. And the question is, is there anything that the rest of the world, from Ruben Heinz, one of our students, is there anything that the rest of the world can give, give in quotes to China to make its rise more peaceful? For example, allow China to run the World Bank, for example. Well, can I um, put it in a slightly um, more philosophical context in my response? Mm. And I, I say this quite purposefully. I think what the rest of the world can give to China is something much more elemental than that. I think what the rest of the world can give to China is respect. And the more Chinese leaders I speak to and senior diplomats and researchers around the world, there's a very basic underlying civilizational question here. Effectively, what the West has said to China for the last 150 years is, will you hurry up and become like us? That's essentially what we've been saying. For God's sake, just hurry up and become like us. Now, I hate to disappoint the Western Academy on this question. I don't think that will necessarily happen. Uh, therefore, when I say respect, I actually mean it at quite a deep civilizational level. And so uh, this is not an airy-fairy academic response to a question seriously put by your student in the other room. I'm actually reflecting on conversations. The forum that you and I attended in Beijing at the end of last year, do you remember the intervention, which was all off the record, so I'll keep it, the source of it correct, uh, anonymous as well, uh, where someone said about a particular point which had been made in the discussion about what the West could learn from China right now, uh, beyond... Um, herbal medicine, okay, mm. and, and a bit of acupuncture on the side. And we were talking about how China goes about developing its policies, remember? Mm. And this very senior Chinese diplomat at the end of the table said, you know, in all his years and sitting in international conferences, official and unofficial, it was the first time anyone in the West ever said to him, that's something we could learn from you on. Now, I simply make those points because, as you know, International relations, foreign policy, and the rest of it is not just about objective interests, national power, and capabilities and intentions. There's a whole bunch of subjectives involved in there as well, and that's one of them. The second question is decentralization, and then... And I will generally be brief on this. Look, I think China has a much more open political discussion now about a range of subjects than it ever did um, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, obviously, that political discussion does not go to the subject of whether the Communist Party should continue in power or not. That is not on the agenda. But on political discussions about a whole bunch of other contentious policy questions, the China that I go to today is like visiting Mars compared with the China that I visited 30 years ago and I first went to live there, which was Venus in 1984. Um, and the reason being is that then you couldn't talk about anything other than the party line. Mm. Now except for the central question of the Communist Party being in power, 
most of these policy discussions about the Chinese about China's future are relatively open. Now I know there's debates about the coming and flowing of censorship, etc., uh, but that's been around for a while as well. And finally, on Chinese software to the world was my interpretation of the question down there. America contributed individualism, contributed um, free enterprise, the entrepreneurial spirit, and that was an exportable, not only did it drive as a piece of software in the American psyche, the uh, future shape of the American economy, it also became something uh, which uh, was uh, America's gift to the world. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, I th there's a lot of truth in that. Here's an observation. The classical critique of the Chinese system is as follows. Chinese folks can't think creatively because they all have to memorize stuff. Secondly, the classical critique is, I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm just repeating what everyone else quietly says to one another, um, uh, that that tradition comes from uh, 2,000 years of memorizing the Chinese Confucian classics, which is how you pass the imperial examination system, and that's what they do into the future. Therefore, uh, the Chinese are great copiers, but they are bad innovators. That's kind of what I describe as the baseline prejudice about it. I think that holds, in reality, I think that holds very little ground these days. Because when I speak to American entrepreneurs and those working in the IT sector, those working in uh, the life sciences, they are now increasingly saying to me that the level of Chinese innovation is going through the roof. I think it's time we challenge one of these old sores, uh, which these old wives' tales, um, I mean that in a non-sexist sense, um, uh, these old conventional wisdoms, because mm. I think something is happening here. Um, and whether it's the mass in reinterpolation of hundreds of thousands of students who have studied abroad, come back to China and are working constructively, creatively and dynamically with the bases of science and research in their own country and adding enterprise picked up from elsewhere, who knows? But if you simply look at the uh, level of patents applications now in China uh, for the protection of their own domestic IP, there is a new innovative culture emerging. Do you mind staying on for five more minutes? Uh, yeah, we, we are five minutes away, but let's try and quickly grab four questions. But if you don't mind, these will be the shortest and sharpest questions in the okay, world. Okay, sure. Please. I'm Tan King Soon from the Tan Ying Kiam Foundation. My question is related to what you, you, you just said. I have noticed that from history, once countries achieve a certain level of prosperity, they evolve into democracy. For example, Taiwan and South Korea gradually evolved into democracy after they attained certain level of prosperity. What are the chances of that happening in China? Thank you. Okay, good question. Next one. Thank you for your profound insights, Mr. Rudd. My name's Evan. I'm a graduate of the Melbourne Business School. And um, I'm going to be a bit greedy, and uh, there are two parts to this question. No, if you've got to make it much right. shorter, I'm sorry. A short, very yeah. short two questions. First one being, it seems that with this consolidation of power into Xi Jinping's hands, it seems mostly benign and pragmatic, but with that consolidation, it depends on the leader being uh, powerful, forceful, in control. If that were to change, my question would be to ask what would the implications be for ASEAN and consequently Australasia, because there are the Chinese interests that are spreading through to Cambodia, very strong Chinese interests in Africa. What would this mean? Will ASEAN be swallowed up by this? Or will this also affect Australia eventually? And the next one, is the part about nation building. It seems that a lot of how China has gone about to uh, approach this uh, state building enterprise is, the, is to have it founded upon the Chinese identity. If you look at the soft power in some movies, it's a lot of it, us against them, the Chinese people, the Han identity, which is fictitious in many ways because it's a very disparate uh, collection of different people, San Guo Yeni, all this explains that too. So would you say that this is a dangerous force this Chinese identity, and if it falls into the wrong hands, could it be abused and turned against the global economy? Okay, Thank it. you. Okay. Next question, yes, please. Oh. Can I use Chinese? Okay, you can one. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, translate for us after that. Quickly, uh, yeah. <laughs> Lukman先生,您是来自澳大利亚的工党,那是一个偏左翼的一个政党。那么在整个今天设计的四个国家里,新加坡,中国,美国和澳大利亚, 
那么这四个政党，新加坡、新加坡、美国、澳洲，还有什么？还有中国、中国和美国这四个国家，呃呃，也许我们可以把它叫 CAS。那么这四个国家的四个政党之间有什么可以互相学习地方？你对他们的，尤其在执政效率方面是怎么样来评价的？因为我们是来自于 MPM 呃公共管理的这样的一个呃一个项目，所以我们希望听到这方面的一些建议，谢谢。就是谈到那个经济方面的效率或者，让明白明白明白的。Okay, last question, very quickly, please. Uh, my name is Henry Chang from SMU. My question is that the speaker already mentioned the success or failure of the China Dream. It depends on the economic reform initiated recently, and then uh, the Chinese government has already become much more pragmatic now. Because they even now willing to say that they can sacrifice growth so long as unemployment can be maintained. Now my question is: If China did slow down, and actually the biggest impact now on uh, not China on the world is in the economic sphere, particularly on the well liquidity side, because now China controls the world's biggest bunch of liquidity. So if China slows down, and is the world prepared in your study? To see how this is going to impact the world's growth trajectories and the future world's financial system, because it seems until now the United States is not willing to let China assume a more active role in the IMF. Thank you. Okay, let me have a go at those three. Um, what's the prospect of China becoming a democracy? I think the question was about um, different countries reaching different uh, levels of per capita income, and then. Uh, flipping over into um, normal democratic processes. I think if you looked at both the ROK's history and at Taiwan's history, it was a little more complex than that. Um, on the China projection, uh, well, the normal diplomatic response which both Kishore and I would give is, one, that's a matter for the Chinese people. Uh, two, what would I then say? Don't hold your breath. Um, uh, by which I mean, as I said before, uh, Xi Jinping's a party idealist who wants to sustain the Chinese Communist Party in power, and he believes he can do that by two means. One, to make it less corrupt, hence this massive anti-corruption campaign, uh, which is much bigger in scope than anything that we have seen in the last um, 20 or 30 years. Um, and it's widening, not narrowing, um, in its trajectory. Number two uh, is sustaining the economic legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party by delivering the goods, uh, higher living standards, but now number three, doing so in an economically sustainable fashion. The real question, therefore, is, is all that of itself deliverable? And does that, therefore, present a long-term legitimacy question for uh, a one-party state? I can't answer that, but if I was to give you a rendition of where the leadership wants to take it now, I do not believe in the back of their heads they have in mind a transition model from where they are now into a form of democratic governance. I'm just being quite blunt with you about uh, how I see it. Number two uh, was about um, uh, the question about... Is it dangerous to have Xi Jinping for so much power? If he consolidates it, will he swallow up ASEAN? Swallow ASEAN <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Australia's experience of ASEAN over 45, 50 years is it's completely unswallowable by anybody, <laughs> <laughs> even by China. And I think you've got a bunch of feisty Singaporeans up the middle. So. <laughs> the, um, That's our role. <laughs> yeah, 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 we know that. We respect it. We like it. The, um, uh, look, there is a certain determinist quality to this as follows. China, as I've said before, by 2023, is likely to be a bigger economy than the United States. As a consequence, it will be the biggest economic partner of most but not all countries in the world. Someone gave me a figure to, the other day which said it's the biggest economic partner, trading partner, I'm sorry, not economic partner, of 83 countries in the world. Now, someone should check that for me because here at the Institute of Public Policy, there's going to be a very bright person who can say to me in 10 minutes, Kevin, that's completely wrong. But there is an inevitability <coughs> about the sheer quantum of economic engagement with 1.3 billion people, uh, a fifth of humanity, between a fourth and a fifth of humanity. And therefore, what happens is um, every country's um, uh, economic policy decision making is going to be increasingly mindful of the Chinese economic reality. 
That's just a fact. The challenge for each nation state is to be very clear in their engagement with China about what their definition is, however, of their role in political sovereignty um, and uh, their role in uh, foreign policy independence. That's a question for each state. And there may be different responses to that, for example, in Laos and in Cambodia, to those which may be delivered uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia or Myanmar. Um, so I, I'd say there is, I said, there's a determinist economic dimension at work here, but then there's a political question which is there free for everyone to answer. Um, as for Hanification, Look, I think that's a very good question. Who was it who asked that? It's that's a, right, yeah. Thank you. It's a very profound question. Um, and frankly, it's the internal debate, as you know, in China, uh, on questions of the difference between patriotism, nationalism, and frankly, uh, I won't say racism, but it's like um, uh, ethno-nationalism. And this is a very complex and confused debate within China itself. Um, here is a word of hope, given all the complexity of that debate. Increasingly, you know, my feeling as a frequent traveler to Beijing is that, uh, frankly, the post-1980 generation was born basically in the period of Sun Zhongchun Hui Zhihou, Chu Shengle. Those born after the big reforms of Deng in the late 70s, early 80s. I begin to sense a quite different mindset on the part of these folks, um, which is, uh, first of all, you speak to any parent who's got a kid born in that period, and they'll say, these kids, where have they come from? Um, they don't do what their parents tell them to do. I always did when I was a kid. Basically, there's a whole level of what I describe as domestic insubordination going on at the, at the moment uh, in China, which is sort of rocking the foundations of the Chinese um, uh, social structure. But these kids are now um, 34 years old at the eldest end of the margin. They're not kids anymore. And so as these folks work through the system, uh, I think there is quite a profound sociological phenomenon unfolding there about how that future Chinese personality will manifest itself in questions of the future shape of Chinese politics, but also the China's future perception of the world as less of an us versus them reality than a more complex interconnected reality. Now, I just leave that for where it is. As for the Chinese question, which was about uh, four countries and their approach to uh, governing parties in the four countries of China, Singapore, Singapore, Zhongguo, Australia, and what else? America. Yeah. Um, how do governing parties in those countries deal with the whole challenge? Which are the four countries again? China, uh, the United China, States, Singapore. China, uh, Australia, Singapore. Oh. Okay. Deal with the question of, uh, let's call it the economic efficiency agenda, in vastly different ways um, and with vastly different imperatives because China is still in that stage of massive capital, economic capital formation, frankly, in its own economic model. Uh, the domestic uh, investment gap in national infrastructure is still large. I'm not talking about residential construction. I'm talking about everything from, you know, uh, Beijing needs a new underground if you're going to deal with the challenge of uh, environmental pollution in China's major cities. Its underground system is not coping. It's, um, it's metro. So the point is, the three developed countries that you've just mentioned there have different economic efficiency challenges to the one developing country. In our country, could I just give you one suggestion? And it's Australia, because I wouldn't comment on my friends as Singaporeans, because someone will jump on top of me for getting something wrong. <laughs> um, uh, even if I was right. The, um, <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> Or well, particularly if I was right. <laughs> the, um, in our country, um, look, when you developed an economy and a relatively successful one, and we've been through, what, 23 years now of sustained economic growth, no recession, um, total factor productivity in the economy, not too bad, labour uh, productivity reasonable against most OECD standards. There are two things that you, three things that you must do in any economic setting, uh, particularly for an advanced economy. One is massive rolling investments in human capital. Um, and there is no shortcut to that. How we think 
how we reason, how we conclude, uh, and how we solve problems and innovate. Uh, that is the biggest variable in any efficiency equation. The second one, of course, is the capital intensity equation. And uh, for countries like China, we've done something quite well and others less well. The whole new revolution which lies in uh, broadband or fibre optic uh, cable for everything as a new transformational platform in how all economies efficiently do the things they currently do, uh, that is a, the biggest piece of uh, economic investment that you can do to promote productivity anywhere in the world. Thirdly is to have an honest, independent uh, umpire, referee, judge as to as to how efficiency is going and what further needs to be done. In our country's case, we have this thing called the Australian Competition Council. Australian, sorry, the ACCC, the um, uh, Australian Consumer and Competition Council. Um, it is a pain in the neck uh, for anyone who's in politics. It's independent. It goes out there and it will produce these outrageous reports on what has to be done to make the economy more efficient. It's absolutely essential that they do so, because otherwise the business of politics will constantly compromise you away from the efficiency objective, which is essential in the total growth equation. Unless, of course, we all finally decide to incorporate into our growth models a good dose of Bhutan and our overall well-being. How's well-being in Singapore, Kishore? Is it going well? Well, it's improving. <laughs> 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 so anyway, I think you've done a brilliant job of answering all these many difficult, complex questions. I, and I'm glad that you... <laughs> I don't need to say anything. They've said it all. So one more time. <laughs> applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Also, thank you to the school. Um, it's a for those of you. They do a lot of stress on. This stress is not good. You don't wish them all joy. So, in the world, this reputation is very high, especially in the United States. All Chinese students should come here and study marketing.